Welcome to the Working Preacher Books Podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Bandit the Podcat. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from working preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, we will talk with Beverly Zink Sawyer and Donna Giver Johnston, authors of For Every Matter Under Heaven, preaching on special occasions in the Working Preacher Books series. Welcome to Beverly and Donna. We are so glad that you could join us on this Working Preacher Books podcast. Thank you, Caroline and Rolf. We're delighted to be here. Happy to join you again. Maybe you could uh, just take a moment and uh, introduce yourselves to our listeners uh, who might not know much about you. I will begin. Um, I'm Beverly Zink Sawyer. I've been ordained as Presbyterian minister for more than 40 years, served a very large suburban church outside Philadelphia for 12 years after seminary, and then a very small rural church in Tennessee while I was doing a PhD at Vanderbilt University. So two extremely different church experiences. And uh, after my graduate work, I was called to serve at Union Presbyterian Seminary where I was professor of preaching and worship for 21 years until I retired a few years ago. But I've continued through those years and since retirement to do lots of teaching and preaching and writing and even pastoring, only now it's on my own time. Thanks, Beverly. Thanks. So I'm Donna Giver Johnston, and I, uh, after I graduated from Princeton Seminary, I was ordained into the Presbyterian Church USA. And I have served four different churches, uh, kind of small, medium, and large in different parts of the country. Um, but then I sensed a call to go back and continue my education. So I went to Vanderbilt, got a PhD there in homiletics and liturgics, um, and then went back to the church. Uh, my journey has been one of both serving the church and the academy. And so just most recently, um, as of a month ago, I have started a new position at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary as a member of the faculty and the, the director of the Doctor of Ministry program. So it's a new adventure, a new chapter, as I continue to uh, seek to serve the church and the academy. Thank you, Donna. I didn't know about your new position, so. <laughs> Brand I'm new. <laughs> I'm excited for that. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, we are really happy to have both of you here. And I, before we get into some of our, our questions that we have for you, I wanted to make sure that our listeners know uh, just what a, a terrific resource this is. I mean, this is one of the Thank things you. that at least I can't, I can't cover adequately in my introduction to preaching mm -hmm. course. We only have one foundations of biblical preaching course, only one required course, at least at this point in our curriculum. And we, I basically have to cover the basics, right? I, to get them to preach a decent sermon with a point is about all I can do in a semester. And then you think about all of the other occasions as this text mm -hmm. address, or this book addresses, of of those sermons that you are preaching into these very particular contexts. And so I want our listeners to realize, I just want to read the, I want to read the content page, <laughs> the table of <laughs> contents, just so people know like what what is offered in this book. And I can't wait to use this book in a in a an elective that I would teach, you know, preaching special occasions, which I think would be a really fun elective. And so baptisms, funerals, calls, commissionings, and commitments, congregational conflicts, closures and changes, older adult communities, holy days and holly, holidays. Uh, I said holy days. <laughs> holy <laughs> days those. and holidays, occasions beyond the walls of the church, weddings and divorces, crises and tragedies, and then you have a beautiful benediction at the end. So, just for us to know that uh, and our readers to know that, I just think it's remarkable. And so thank you for that. And then on chap in, in the first chapter on page seven, you quote David Buttrick 
And what you're offering really here is a hermeneutic of human situations. And I, I just love that. So thank you for one. Yeah. Just like I wanted to make sure our listeners knew what they, what they're getting when they, when they get this book. And so, but, but a, a question for you. I love that you you tackle this topic, as I said, this occasional preaching, but particularly from the from the standpoint of biblical preaching, because that's always a challenge for preachers, right? Mm-hmm. Is to select the right text to fit the occasion. And how do you do that? So tell us a little bit about that method that you present in the book of choosing that the text for that particular context. I think that's something with which preachers really struggle. What text do I choose? If I can uh, first connect to what you were saying, Caroline, about what we were doing with the book, this book did come out of a course that I taught many times at Union. When I came to the seminary, I was really blessed to have a dean and colleagues, department colleagues, who said, after you teach the basic course, you can teach whatever you want. So it's like, wow. Um, So what I had to think about was things that were missing in my seminary education. And having been a pastor for 15 plus years at that point, I had some idea of what that was. And as you say, it's really hard to put everything into a a, um, seminary curriculum. And one of the things that I remember struggling with most as a pastor was those occasions that didn't have a lectionary, lectionary text Uh, Because I think we are taught in most of our seminaries to begin with the text and then work forward through the listeners to the situation. We turned that on its head and said, really, it's better for these occasions where there's maybe not a prescribed text or that prescribed text isn't necessarily appropriate for the occasion, how do you get there? So how do we maintain the integrity of the text and how do we remain biblical preachers? So we need a process. And then that's how we came up with this three-step process that we begin with what's going on, you know, what's, what's happening, what's the situation, and then who's going to be there? the context in terms of of the listeners. And then that leads us to questions about where do we see God? And what is the the message? How do we point to God in this situation for those who are gathered? And that's going to take us back to texts. Donna, um, add, because we we came up with it. I have been using this process for many years in teaching. And then when Donna and I started working together on the book, we really re- refined it uh, and, and came up with what's in the book. And that's what we were. We we're so glad to do this together because Beverly, um, she was a pastor, as she said, for 15 years. But a lot of her years was was teaching as a professor of preaching. And at that time, I was serving a church um, and so we thought doing kind of a professor and a pastor who has to preach every week and has to attend to these these uh, out of the ordinary occasions would be a really good way to go about it. And certainly I wrote this book while I was at a pastor, um, not only preaching every Sunday, but also responding to all of these different situations that come up. And often, you know, the first question I ask is the one that, that Paul says, you know, is that what then shall we say about these things in Romans? Um, and so that was always my question. What do I say about these things? Well, what are these things? So what is going on here? Who's listening? And then where is God in this? So it just felt like a very natural process. Um, but it, but I realized that also so many times when you're caught unaware and something happens so quickly and you're already busy as a pastor. And so how do we make it easy for pastors to find their way? There's some really challenging situations, and this is our attempt to help help pastors do that. Mm-hmm. We wanted to make it easy, but we wanted to honor all of those elements of preaching, the, 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 the situation, the world around us, what's going on, what brings us together uh, in this time of worship. The people who are gathered, what might they be thinking, feeling, what are they bringing with them, and then also honor the, the presence and work of God as we see it through the biblical texts. And if I can add a word about um, the lectionary, because many of the people who will be, be reading this book are, are lectionary preachers. 
before I say say more about more about um, that, I want to say that there are many different lectionaries now too that we need to take into account. And when we made references to the lectionary in the book, it was the Revised Common Lectionary. But we realized there are many different lectionaries that preachers and churches are using these days. But this process works also for lectionary preachers because you can still begin with the situation and the listeners and then go back to whatever the texts are suggested for that day. Maybe it'll help you choose one of those texts or it might help you see that text through a particular lens in a different way than if you had started with the text and worked forward. Uh, in your opening, you highlight uh, the Old Testament scholar Ellen Davis, who says that preachers need to serve as first listener to the text. Maybe you could unpack that a little bit. Right. So I'll let you go next, Beverly. But just the idea of you know thinking about Moses going to the mountain uh, to to hear God's word and then to bring it to the people, and so to be the first person who listens to the text on behalf of of their people. So, you know, we know our people, we know what they're struggling with, we know what their questions are. And so to be the first one that actually listens to the text on behalf of um, and for the sake of the people that you'll be preaching to. You know, preaching comes with great privileges and great responsibilities. And one of those responsibilities is that we are the ones who stand up from the congregation to use an image that, that Tom Long includes in his textbook, The Witness of Preaching. We are the ones who stand up as the witnesses and take on that responsibility of going to the text with our listeners in mind on behalf of the people. And we, I think we all would agree that preaching is personal, experiential, incarnational, that it has to begin with some transformation in us so that when we as the preacher go and encounter the text, we can then go back and say, this is what I've seen. This is what I've heard. Just the way Jesus called disciples and said, come and see. And the women who gathered at, at the empty tomb on, on Easter morning were told, see what's happened, go and tell. So it's the same. I think it's a, it's a, it's a time honored tradition of our faith that we are to go and then report what we have experienced, how we've been transformed. So the preacher also always has to have that first encounter, I think, with, with the text and how God is at work through that text in our lives and in this community and then go back and report to the folks. I have, I have a follow up on that, which is um, in a lot of times in funeral or, um, or wedding sermons, there's a different first listener, which is, you know, the couple. Uh, usually I'll address a wedding sermon directly to the couple or uh, directly to a family, especially uh, sort of the more crisis the funeral, the more directly I'll talk to a bereaved spouse or family. Um, how does that work to think about different sort of circles of listeners too in those special occasions. Yeah, I do the same thing, Rolf. I address my um, wedding funeral, wedding sermon to the, the couple and everyone else is listening in. Um, but as we tried to talk about in the book, it's really important to ask who is listening and that gets at those different circles, right? So some people will come to the funeral uh, because they're grieving and they need to be comforted. Other people will come just because they know the family to show their support. Others will come because maybe they um, really did something that was not, you know, that was hurtful to the person who died and they never had reconciliation. So there's lots of different people listening. So I think the more that you can think about who are those listeners and what kind of word do they each need to hear? And then that really um, influences the way that you craft your sermon. There's always a balance when we deal with those occasions that are occasioned by an individual or individuals, whether it be, you know, weddings, funerals, um, calls, commissionings, ordinations, um, confirmations, where the event is, is focused on an individual. But I think there really needs to be a balance between addressing um, qualities in that individual and what has brought us and that person to that day, but then also how we see God 
in the lives and work. Um, where God has been in that person or those person's lives, where God is and where God is going to be moving forward. So in other words, we use that person as a, a way of, uh, we, we look at the individual, but also look through and beyond the individual to where God can be and how we all can connect to that and see God's work in our lives. So there's always always that balance between the, the celebration or acknowledgement of the individual, but also, as, as I always said to my students, it's about God and it's not about us. Um, keep that, that, that balance and the focus on God's work through this individual on this occasion. I have a, I want to follow up a little bit more with that too, with regard to funeral sermons, because Donna, you talk about that in chapter three, which are, which I think we all know are some of the hardest, right? Um, occasions for preaching, but they can also be, the most rewarding in some ways. And a lot of what you've already said in terms of the way in which you are, uh, you know, who are the listeners and those, the many contexts that, that people themselves are bringing to that funeral moment. What, Donna, what do you think is the, what makes funeral preaching so hard and maybe even, even share an experience of, of one of those occasions for you? Yeah, it's for me, it's definitely holy ground. Um, we have the privilege of standing with people there at the time when they're most vulnerable, when they have looked into death's abyss, right? And they need to know how to go on living. It really makes uh, an opportunity to preach God's word. Um, and as Henri Nouwen says, you know, in the letter of consolation to his father after his mother's death, he, he talks about where our wounds hurt most. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it so hard, right? Is be, but it's so important to name those wounds you know, to not kind of offer cheap grace, uh, everything's going to be fine, or they're in heaven with God or whatever. But to really don't be afraid to name where those wounds hurt, um, to lift that up. And then people really have ears to hear the gospel once you've acknowledged their pain. Um, and so what makes funerals hard for me is uh, that you, you know the people, you love the people. So, you know, I think of a funeral I did for Sandy, who was such a dear member of our congregation and battled cancer for years and everybody was praying their hearts out, you know, and then she, she, she died. Um, but when I visited her in, her in the hospital before to plan the funeral, she said, I want you to sing, I'll fly away. I want the choir to, to use tambourines. You know, this is a celebration because I have lived, you know, my life in faith and I trust that God will be with me even in death. So she actually ended up, I was able to use her words, you know, to comfort the congregation because she died with such faith. Mm. So people that you know well are hard, but also people that you don't know at all, right? So you're called by a funeral home, funeral director to do a funeral and I walked into one where this young man died, you know, of a drug overdose. I'd never met him or his family. And I thought, what in the world am I going to say? Mm -hmm. And um, I walked over to his father and knelt down and I just said, I'm so sorry. And he and I said, can you tell me a little bit about your son? And he said, well, when he was a kid, he has an, he had an imaginary friend named Jesus. Oh. And so that was <laughs> The one that was with him as a child is still with him now, you know, and so sometimes I think you just need to listen to the people, listen to their stories, and then you can weave God's story in their story. The, those that I think Donna would agree, those, those difficult sermons that, that we're called upon to preach, one of the things that I think we need to do also is to make ourselves vulnerable and transparent and say, this is hard. It's very difficult because again, we're taking that responsibility. We're supposed to have the answers. People look up to us in the pulpit and say, you're supposed to have the answers. You're supposed to have it together. But to be able to say, you know what? I, I don't have the answers. I don't know. We're, we're in this together and God is still with us and God is going to 
lead us forward to to a better place and trust. But that kind of transparency and vulnerability in those moments when we are either at a loss for words or that we are grieving ourselves or feel feel abandoned to be able to acknowledge that and say, you know, I share this and we support each other. And it's amazing that the there's kind of an emotional support that you can get too from the congregation that that comes through when you express that kind of genuine feeling of, of vulnerability. I really, uh, I was, uh, uh, the title of the book comes from Ecclesiastes three. And then for each of the chapters, you, um, uh, you have a sort of one, one of those, uh, sometimes the entire sort of antithesis, you know, uh, a time to be sometimes just one a time to be born or a time to die, but others, um, uh, you know, you'll have both. I was at a, I was at a funeral recently and, and, and the pastor did a brilliant thing. He said, it says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to mourn and a time to dance, to weep and to laugh and funerals are both. And then maybe weddings are both too sometimes. Uh, t- uh, t- talk about, you know, just what did you learn about that text from looking at it through special occasions? Okay, thanks, Rolf, for asking about our our use of Ecclesiastes 3. Um, For a long time, I had been thinking about a a book such as this, and I thought of that that text and, and using part of it as a title first, realizing that it captures so many of the uh, human events and emotions of our lives. And then as Donna and I began collaborating, it was really a gift of that collaboration that we decided to use either a, a, a verse or a clause from each of the, the verses in that text, and some of them together, because we often live in that dichotomy of, of war and peace, of love and hate, um, all of these, these things that are mixed emotions, often in the same kind of e- event in, in our lives. So it became a wonderful way of, in a sense, hanging a lot of human experiences onto these lovely phrases. And Donna, um, we we really worked on this together. So uh, share what you thought about this. Right. I mean, and we certainly tried to weave that through is, um, you know, we could have, uh, as you know, there's so many different situations. We could have written a, a much larger book, right? Uh, for anything you could possibly think of that's out of an ordinary Sunday morning sermon. Um, and as we began to look at those chapters, though, we thought, well, that's not really you know, particularly interesting just to kind of have a catalog. And so just more poetic, you know, being able to think in terms of, um, you know, these are some examples of different seasons that we live through in our lives and then give some examples. But certainly this is not an exhaustive volume, but we figure that once we give people um, the the process um, and um, give some you know, evocative images and seasons, then they'll be able to find their way no matter what, what they face in their, in their ministry. It occurred to me that you could have a, um, another chapter on preaching in faculty meetings and it could be a time to keep silence. <laughs> as the, as the newly appointed academic dean. So yes, a time to keep silence would be a good chapter. <laughs> <laughs> I would like, I want to go to we've we've done funerals and now I want to go to weddings because I think that's also one of the uh, uh more frequent right preaching opportunities for our listeners and has uh, its set of challenges as well and and you talk about that in that the one thing that the couples most want is you know, this perfect moment that will be <laughs> enshrined and, you know, all memory and all eternity. And, but usually, <laughs> typically that doesn't happen uh, in, in weddings or all kinds of things that happen, but that uh, preaching in this setting is about testifying to the promise of God's love in our imperfection. And, but, but also how, how, What do you think is the primary, share with our listeners, what is the primary role of a, of a sermon at a wedding and, and in in the ways in which that gets maybe communicated in that preaching moment? Yeah. 
Yeah, weddings are tricky, right? And actually, most of my colleagues would much rather do a funeral than a wedding any day. <laughs> Uh, because you sort of get, you know, feel like you're being used in some way or you just kind of get lost in the day. Uh, but I never felt that way, actually. I love doing premarital counseling and really getting to know the couple. And then I felt like my role was to stand in the midst of that kind of <laughs> pandemonium and to and to testify to God's love, you know, covenantal love as they're making covenants to each other. God's covenantal love that... Um, you know, is going to be with us in all the different seasons of our life. Um, that love, um, you know, bears us, believes us, you know, hopes, hopes all things, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That even if a couple's love does end, that God's love will never end. So, you know, I think that, that that's the purpose of the sermon at a wedding, as well as to call us then to do our best to live in to those covenants that we make. So I'm always aware of people sitting in the pews. You know, they're listening, over, overhearing my sermon to the couple. And some people are, you know, going to happily married couples. Others are divorced. Others are, you know, not believing that love is even possible in this day and age, that kind of thing. And so testifying to God's love that is, you know, holds us no matter where we find ourselves along that road. So I've always found it to be a great joy. And as I say in the book, too, I always send it to couples afterwards because I tell them, I said, you're never going to remember anything I say today because you're thinking about everything else. So like I send it to them later. And uh, one couple actually said that they read it on their first on their anniversary every year. They read the sermon just to remember, you know, what was said that day and the promises that they made to each other. That is. Well, um, I, I want to move to some questions uh, about just the sources of inspiration about preaching in general. Uh, and um, one thing that happens to almost all of us is that uh, at some point we just get stuck. Um, what do you do when you get stuck? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's rare not to get stuck at at some point, um, particularly because when we're thinking about these kinds of special occasions, because we often don't have the luxury of time to think about them. I'm the kind of person that likes to plan ahead for everything. And I like to know, you know, if I'm preaching next month, I need to have the, the text chosen and be thinking about this and letting letting the text and experiences percolate, you don't always have that luxury if, if there's a crisis. I mean, gosh, um, yet another horrible shooting uh, was reported last night on the news in El Paso. This is happening so frequently. Whatever the the event may be, it often comes unexpected. So then how do, how do you get unstuck? Um, and I think... Asking questions of, of ourselves as well as the text that we've chosen, making connections. Um, and, and some of the questions I used to raise with my students, they would get tired of seeing me writing in the, in the old days when we actually wrote on pieces of paper that students would turn in sermon manuscripts or, or later on the computer computer I would was would put on well this is a really nice concept and and it's it's true but what does this look like what does this feel like um, how or where do we experience this so I think that raising those kinds of questions I try to do that with myself as well I mean what does what does this feel like for us where where is God where do we see God where might we look for God in this situation so it's the only way I get unstuck is by starting to raise questions Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, the normal things about just sitting with the word, uh, going for a walk, that kind of thing. But I think actually thinking about our process here, the more that I spend time asking, you know, what's going on, uh, whether it's diving deep into the news story or it's asking people to tell me about their loved one who died, the more that I spend time asking that question first and getting to know the situation and the people that are going to be there, I find that it's so much easier to get unstuck. Uh, but if I start with the, the scripture and say, you know, God, I, I need a word, but I haven't done the work of understanding, well, who's going to come and who's going to listen and what are they, what, what, what word are they hoping to hear? If I haven't done that, then I often find myself stuck. 
Um, but certainly at the at the last minute, if I'm still stuck, I say, you know, speak, Lord, your people are listening <laughs> soon and very soon, and they need a word. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of the things that about this book is in, in, we often ask the question of our, of our authors, uh, what is the hardest sermon you've ever preached and how did you get through it? I'm, I want to tweak that question a little bit for the two of you and to say, is there, uh, with all of the occasions that you have talked about in this book, what, what occasion, and maybe, I don't know, maybe the, you can't answer this, but what occasion do you find the hardest to preach in? Uh, given given the collection of occasions that you have presented in your book, is there one occasion that you find particularly difficult and why? I would say that um, rather than an occasion, a kind of occasion would be one where I am suffering and experiencing the same thing as as my listeners. Um, it, it, again, in, in some ways, it helps us relate to, to what they are feeling and what they might need because it's what I might need as well. But um, they're, they're the difficult ones. Again, back to what I was saying about transparency and vulnerability to have to say, this hurts. I'm hurting too. We're all hurting together. And in a way, it helps move us beyond that and say, what are we going to do? How are we going to support each other? Where do we see God leading us into a, a new future? But I would say for me, it's the ones where where I am hurting, grieving, feeling much the way the listeners are feeling. Yeah, for me, I would say, you know, um, political issues. <laughs> so, you know, the th the things that happen in the world that you so much want to preach about, but you're aware of people from different perspectives sitting in your pews. Um, and so to how to be prophetic and pastoral at the same time, right? So, you know, the Sunday after George Lloyd was, or George Floyd was killed, um, you know, it was a moment where I had to speak into that, into that pain and into that, you know, protest that was, um, that was uh, spilling over. Um, and so, you know, to speak our words as, as preachers, but I also wanted to say to trust the liturgy, uh, to carry that as well. You know, your words don't just have to be proclaimed, but they can be prayed, uh, they can be sung. Uh, for me that Sunday, I got on my knees and knelt for the whole time that George Floyd was down um, and had people just be in silence for the eight minutes and 46 seconds. So. I think sometimes, you know, our silence can actually speak louder than our words. And so don't be afraid to, um, you know, use the liturgy uh, to carry a day that's particularly difficult to find your own words to speak. Uh, maybe one more question in these uh, these sources of inspiration. What are you what are you reading these days that is capturing your attention or your imagination or inspiring in your work? Are there is there a book or an author or? Or, or maybe a, maybe there's a TV show that you're that is you're finding. I've been I've been watching The Last of Us, which is a really fascinating um, an entry into human relationship and survival. But but uh, yes, or something, or maybe you have a go-to that like this. I know that I'm going to be inspired or uplifted by this resource or author. Well, I'm I'm a big mystery reader and watcher. And I think that mysteries are interesting because they get to a lot of those hidden human emotions that people uh, don't even know sometimes about themselves. So I, I find that a way of figuring out human nature and how people react and respond and, and motivations. Uh, and that kind of feeds into preaching. Um, Otherwise, I like to read widely, lots of uh, favorite um, poems, poetry. Um, I like Marilyn Robinson's works. Um, just finished through Advent, my husband and I went through the writings of, uh, some of the writings of Howard Thurman, which always are inspiring. Uh, I love yeah, books of books of prayers and just um, all kinds of things. History is another thing that I that I love to read. 
Well, my, mine's a little bit funny because I just moved into this new office at the seminary, um, leaving the church that I served for 10 years since so I packed up my office. And so literally I'm looking at all the boxes of my books <laughs> that have just been delivered that I haven't unpacked yet. So, but I have three books that are sitting on my desk that I wanted to bring with me so I didn't lose them in the boxes. So I'll just share the ones that are sitting on the top of my desk. Um, to Bless the Space Between Us, a book of blessings by John O'Donohue. Daily Prayer with the Cor Cormelia Community by Padraig Otumo. And uh, Circle of Grace, a book of blessings for all the seasons, Jan Richardson. So these are wonderful books that, you know, for, again, I think, my mind, my, my mind is still thinking about the seasons of Ecclesiastes. So for all the seasons, these books um, help us find a word of, um, of comfort, a word of hope, a word of grace uh, for the journey ahead. Um, and then I just um, wanted to put in a plug for Ross Gay, who is a poet who's written um, Inciting Joy, a book of, uh, a book of blessings. Um, he's, he's been doing some incredible work and um, just spent a week with him. So uh, if you don't know him, you know, check out his podcasts or his books. Uh, really um, a blessing. Awesome. Well, uh, we... We often have a third host for the podcast uh, <laughs> who is banned at the podcast. He hasn't shown up yet today, um, oh, dear. but uh, he has some questions for you, especially uh, Beverly. Okay. Uh, and that is, um, yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, what is your favorite animal and why is it a cat? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, yes, it, it used to be a cat. We had a cat by the name of Karis, who was indeed a note of grace in our lives. But I'm afraid we've changed loyalties and now have a dog. But nevertheless, um, I love all creatures, great and small. <laughs> I, I, I will t accept any of them and love them all equally. Awesome. <laughs> well, Bandit also wants to know, is there a game that you could play endlessly and never get bored? It would probably be a word game. Um, Boggle was always one of my favorites. And I used to pay, play with that with my mom all the time who loved word games and Scrabble. In fact, Santa Claus just brought me a new Scrabble game for, <laughs> for Christmas. So I'm ready to take on my, my husband and anybody else um, at the game of Scrabble. So anything having to do with words. Is uh, Bandit would also like to know which biblical character do you think would most likely own a cat? Oh, I think the Queen of Sheba. <laughs> I think she definitely had some lovely Persians in that entourage when she came to consult and and challenge um, <laughs> Solomon. Definitely, I love that. And and Bandit has one more question, and that is. He would like to know what food you could eat every day. I could eat fried shrimp and rice pudding every day. My right. favorites. I think he could he could maybe share in that. Yeah, I could, <laughs> yeah, awesome. yeah. Sea, seafood awesome. and right, yeah. Bandit should like <laughs> some some seafood like I do. Yeah. Well, Beverly and Donna, this has been such a rich and wonderful conversation. We're so excited about your book. And so thank you for being here with us on the podcast. And thanks for listening to this episode of Working Preacher Books Podcast. Stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org. You can follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher book series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.